Jeremy, you're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you everyone being here tonight. A show of solidarity with all those taking strike action and all those people that are dreaming, hoping, praying and demanding and working for a different and better society. But I want to also say thank you to all those that have organised tonight's event because these things don't happen by accident. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, all the Trades Council and all the unions that supported this particular event, which is also being live streamed to a lot of people outside of this room and all over, not just our borough, but all over the country and no doubt other places as well, because it is about communication and about getting our message across. This is, yes, a series of industrial disputes, and I'll come on to those in a moment, but it's also really about the kind of world and kind of society that we want to live in. Do we really want to live in a world in this country where there are more food banks than there are branches of McDonald's, where there's a huge mental health crisis amongst people in work, amongst people out of work, and amongst students in school and college? Do we want to live in a world where the very richest have enriched themselves many, many fold over the past two and three years particularly, and wages have been stagnant or falling, and living standards are collapsing. Do we really want to be in a world where people are so desperate, they hang around outside a supermarket to ask somebody to give them something out of their bag when they come out of the supermarket? That is what we've reduced this country to. And it's disgusting, it's disgraceful, and it's unnecessary. And all the time, we have the super rich flaunting it, flaunting it at us. And if you listen to commercial radio during the day, what do you find but subliminal adverts attacking the public sector? <coughs> subliminal adverts for private education. Subliminal adverts for private health care. And today, the Secretary of State for Health announced he'd held a very, as he described it, very useful round table with all the private health providers in Downing Street to discuss the role they might play in healthcare in the future. I've only got one message for him, it's quite simply this. Take over the private healthcare hospitals and put them in the NHS. Yeah. And instead of saying that we will improve the care service around the country by putting yet more money into the private care sector. Do what our council has done, take services back in-house, and let's have a national care service on the same principles as the National Health Service. Care when you need it, free at the point of use. Surely that has to be the right way of doing it. Otherwise, you just see the stress level that so many people go through. And then when you go through all of the strikes that are on at the moment. There's a very good reason for every one of them, but for anyone watching this who just happens to be tuned in from the Daily Mail, I'll just say this to you. <laughs> Daily Mail readers, nobody takes strike action lightly. Nobody loses wages lightly. Nobody walks out of work lightly. They know the issues, they know the problems, and they know the hardship. But they're doing it because there is no alternative. And I wasn't in the least bit surprised by the firefighters vote today. A service that we all rely on, a service that we admire, a service that we all applaud has lost, wait for it, 20% of all firefighters have lost their jobs in the past 10 years. In other words, there's a fifth less firefighters. Is it surprising that response times are slower? Inevitably is the case. And then you look at the firefighters, look at health workers, look at the stress they're going through, and it's all very well for Tory MPs to turn up in A&E departments and say, we applaud the innovation of those staff who are managing to convert chairs into beds so that people can wait in the, ho wait in the, in the corridors in a more congenial atmosphere. Huh? <laughs> Where are the beds that are needed why have we closed so many? Why have we reduced the number of beds in hospitals? 
And why are we now talking magnificently about care at home without any carer? The whole principle of healthcare is care. Yes, you need the medicines, but you also need that psychological support. We all know that. When you feel ill, it's people talking to you as much as the medicines that will help you to get better as well. They seem, don't seem to understand any of that. And so to the nurses taking strike action, I know the pain they're going through. I've discussed it with them. They're doing it because they feel there is no alternative than that is a way of getting decent pay and conditions. And then teachers. Again, I'm not surprised at the massive vote by teachers all over the country. Why do so many young people study at university, study to be a teacher, go through the whole qualification process, proud to become a teacher, and then find that they're buried under an avalanche of tick box exercises to what they should or shouldn't be doing in school, a national curriculum that's imposed upon them, much of the innovation and joy is taken out of teaching, and because of the shortage of teaching assistants, teaching um, a mixed ability class becomes very, very difficult to retain the attention of all those students. Is it surprising that so many teachers end up leaving the profession, a profession they dreamt of joining when they were at school or college themselves? So we're wasting the ambition and the love of teaching of so many teachers. It is just so stupid for any modern society to throw away the skills of nurses, the skills of firefighters, the skills of teachers. For what? So that somebody somewhere can get yet another, even bigger tax break, and be even richer, and then this trickle-down theory of economics will take hold. I'll tell you what, there ain't no trickle-down. It is greed that is destroying our public services and our public sector. I'd just like to say this about others who are not um, necessarily in a union yet. I've been on picket lines with a lot of the postal workers over the past few months as we all have. And on that beautiful day in August when we started, we had that great rally outside the sorting office on the Bush Industrial Estate. And I said, it's not going to be like that in November and December. It wasn't, and it isn't. And it is tough, and absolute hats off to all the posties for the loyalty they've shown to the union, to the union for its ability to communicate, and for their doughty campaign. And again, it's not just about pay. It is about the pressure they're put under. It is about a computer logging every step they take and a manager then waiting to say, well, you got back five minutes early, so you've got to do five minutes more tomorrow. Come on. These are people that want to be postal workers because they enjoy doing the job of being part of the community. And so what Kai was saying about community wealth building working with the CWU is so welcome because it is about the contribution that unions and all can make to our society. But Royal Mail, a very profitable, very wealthy organisation, essentially wants to turn them into gig workers a la Amazon. That is what it's about. And so... This is a fight about wages, about conditions, about respect, but it's also about inspiring people who work at Starbucks, who work at Amazon, who are employed by um, Samworth's Bakery and so many others who need to be in unions. You'll find a table at the back from PJP, Peace and Justice Project, where we're campaigning for union recognition in that baking industry, as well as in Amazon and Starbucks, because we need to bring into union membership all those people that are forced to work on the gig economy, forced to work in the gig economy where their only friend is a mobile phone that tells them whether they've got a job or not, whether they've got any work or not, how many hours they've got. That is inhuman the way people are being treated. And at the same time, we now have going through Parliament yet another piece of legislation to damage or destroy trade union rights. In Italy, Spain and France, there is a constitutional right for unions to be consulted, or an obligation actually, and it, they don't have anything like the minimal service legislation the government is now proposing. 
They're proposing minimal service legislation because Grant Shapps claims that none of the unions were prepared to protect the emergency services during strike action. Absolute nonsense. I was standing with the ambulance workers on Brewery Road. They were quite rightly taking action to demand decent paying conditions. They also had more than one eye on the radio in case there was a very serious emergency and they would run to deal with that serious emergency. Working class communities don't let down other working class communities. They take action in order to support each other. That is really what this whole dispute is about. So when they take away our liberties through the police and public order bill, when they demonize migrants because they're desperate people trying to find a place of safety and contribute to our world, I absolutely agree with what Joe and others have said earlier. Every one of those people, desperate people in Calais trying to get to a place of safety. Do you know what? Tomorrow they'll be our neighbour. Tomorrow they'll be our teacher. Tomorrow they'll be our nurse. Tomorrow they'll be our engineer. They are the people of the future. Let us not allow the racist right to divide us. We are united. United as a community to bring about the kind of social change and social justice that we want in our world. And when our media spend their time denigrating workers as they've always done. Now, I've been involved in um, industrial actions and I was a union organiser before I became a member of, of Parliament. And uh, the abuse that we was heaped upon us during every one of those strikes was absolutely incredible. It is important that we communicate with each other, that we set up our own forms of communication. We only have one daily paper you can rely on. That's the Morning Star and Ben Chaco is here tonight. Thank you, Ben for being here tonight. Um, but it is important that we communicate with each other. The technology is there. The technology is there to do that communicating. It's up to us to make sure that we control it and we're able to get that message across. I think all leaders, political, union or anything else, should always be held to account. That is absolutely fair and right. But the way in which our media just abuse Mick Lynch, abuse Dave Ward, abuse Kevin Courtney, abuse anybody that pokes their head above the parapet. That's just not acceptable. And so it's our solidarity that is so important. But what's different this time, it's very different this time, is that the mass of the public are not fooled by all this nonsense. They understand why these industrial actions are taking place. They understand that sense of unity. And you know what? When the rail workers win their pay rise, when the firefighters win their pay rise, when the teachers win their pay rise, when the civil servants win their pay rise, when the posties win their pay rise, everything changes because we can then also tackle the issue of poverty, of homelessness and all the rest of the issues. The politics of today sadly is often not represented in Parliament. The politics of today is what happens in the public meetings, in the demonstrations, outside the food banks, in the community centres. It's that wonderful creative thinking of artistic endeavour, of industrial endeavour, of the kind of community and society we want to live in. It's our solidarity through social media, through physical contact and all that that is going to win these disputes and in doing so, it's going to be bye-bye soon. I can bye-bye the Tories. I am fed up with inequality, injustice, and enforced poverty in this country. I defeat it and win with the strikes on Wednesday. Thank you very much.